And hello, and welcome again to the Weird West Telethon, where I am doing interviews that connect to my upcoming Kickstarter, well, my current Kickstarter project, Once Upon a Time in the Weird West. We're just waiting for Kat to log in here, and then we'll get started. In the meantime, Kat Rambo, I've, uh, I've been working with her for... I don't know, like a few months now, I think. There she is. <laughs> Perfect. Hey. Hi. Sorry about that. I was Hello. logged in. Didn't realize I had to also click go on the air. So here I am. Oh, that thing is so silly. Like, it... <laughs> I did. But I'm glad you made it. Welcome. Kat Rambo is the, um, she is a Nebula and uh, many other award nominated author. She is also an author of Weird Westerns and Steampunk. And she is the president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. And we have had opportunities to talk before, but not on this subject. And I've been looking forward to it. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you for well, thank being you for here the today. chance to be here. It's something that I like talking about and it's super timely for me cuz I teach a class on uh, steampunk and weird western and I'm in the process of doing the on demand version of that. So it's all very fresh and on my mind at the moment. That is excellent. I'll have to take that class. <laughs> Yeah, so for the unin un uninitiated, let's start with what is okay. Weird Western? I'm prepared to answer that. So Weird Western is in some ways, I think, it's it's not exactly a subgenre of steampunk, but it's closely allied because they're coming out at the same uh, time period. I've gotten some odd echo. Let me make sure that uh, I've got everything closed off. No worries. Um, For the record, oh, you're I'm not, not hearing, hearing it. Okay, it, then so, I'm not going to yeah. worry about it too much. So, um, okay. Weird Western is basically, it's a regular Western, but it has elements of fantasy or horror or maybe even science fiction that are added to it. So it, it uses all the Western tropes. Uh, there's often the landscape is a big part of it and the image of the gunslinger. And I think uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower series is a very good example of something that falls kind of in the weird Western region. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Dark Tower series. I wasn't a fan of the movie, but of course, nobody who read the books was. So, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, uh, Dark Tower. Um, there was that uh, movie that came out several years back. Now, I guess it must have been in the '90s. I feel old all of a sudden. But uh, Wild, oh, yeah. Wild West, <laughs> which was based on the old TV show. Do you remember the right. TV show? Or you may be too young. You know, I don't, I never saw the TV show. Yeah, that's too bad. I, I think I would have loved it. But uh, yeah, right. Um, and um, I guess, you know, sci-fi Westerns related, but not quite. Although it was a terrible movie. So please don't judge the genre by it. But Cowboys oh, yeah, versus yeah, yeah. Aliens. <laughs> but yeah, now I really love the the whole just the the possibilities that open up with it which is why i like writing it and i also like the unexpected element of it right people people know mm -hmm. westerns everybody's seen a spaghetti western right so they come to it and they're like okay so i know what to expect and then all of a sudden we have lovecraftian monsters <laughs> or you know uh witch slinging hexes or you know something funky like that maybe even dragons who knows and people are going wait what and i love that so comparatively how would you describe steampunk so steampunk is i think a really interesting genre because it's science fiction but it's very specialized science fiction. It's what we call science fantasy. And usually its primary thing is that it incorporates steam technology and also sort of a 19th century steam powered machine aesthetic. 
and then that range is all over the place too. Usually it's alternate history, but it can even go uh, and be uh, futuristic, right? You can have a secondary world that is steampunk, or you could even have a, a space world that somehow has a steampunk flavor to it. I believe that the uh, Ur novel of the genre was the difference oh, yeah. engine. Am I correct about that? This is one people keep citing. Yeah, so, uh, and that's... I remember William Gibson. I don't remember his co-author, though. Oh, should I... <laughs> who, who was his co-author? I should Oh, my know. God. I should remember. And, you, and it's just <laughs> fallen out of my head entirely. I don't... It wasn't Stevenson, was it? Was the two of them working together? I don't... Well, act it could have been Stevenson. It, I think it was actually. Yeah, that sounds right. I hope I hope we're right about that. <laughs> I just uh, it's William uh, William Gibson's on my mind because we did a cyberpunk panel for the Sifway YouTube channel the other day. So that is why his name came fresh. It's not a matter of author preference. And it's, it's Bruce but, Sterling. Yeah, Bruce Sterling is the co-author. Oh, that's it. Bruce Sterling. Okay, duh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bruce Sterling. I'm, I'm sure both he and Gibson are watching I'm, I'm this. Saying, but I'm sure both he and Gibson are watching this. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, they'll they'll see this, you know, and they'll go. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, steampunk is also something that I really enjoy, and there's been all kinds of explorations of that. A series that I really like is by Stephen mm -hmm. Hunt. And that's your example of your futuristic steampunk because there was an apocalypse and then because, I don't know, something about physics changed, I think. And then they rebuilt everything with this steam technology and each of his stories in the series, they all stand alone, but they're mm -hmm. all connected and in the same world. And I love it. I think it's amazing. So, yeah, lots of, lots of different stuff. So pretty weird and wild stuff, but also grounded in a certain gritty realism i think well so what do you no, oh, no, i, I think you're about yeah. to ask me what i like about writing weird western is that possible that's what i am asking okay. yeah awesome. <laughs> um reasons that i love uh, kind of both steampunk and weird western it is i think many of them center on the historical era because that era is an era of huge philosophical change. You've got all these movements. You've got the spiritualist movement. You've got the free love movement. You've got the abolitionist movement. You've got the temperance movement. You've got the suffrage movement. Uh, you've got transcendentalism and all these sort of utopias uh, springing up. And so Karl Marx is writing, uh, you know, at that time as well. It's an era of exploration, which opens up a whole bunch of possibilities, right? There that you can have places where there's you know, sort of pockets of weirdness, overlap, uh, overlapping dimensions. And it lends itself well to stories of exploration, which I think are handy because they give you a sort of built-in narrative structure, right? You know, you're getting from point A and exploring point B. And you're also getting exploration, not just of the landscape, but of the sciences, right? You're getting all the uh, inventors. And it's also got all this fabulous texture to it, right? It's the Victorian era and there's all sorts of uh, cool arts in fashion and bits of brass and clockwork. And I, I just, I love the texture. And I also, I grew up uh, spending summers in Kansas with my grandparents and we went to Dodge City and I love, the gunslinger era. And one of the joys of Wild West is that when you start getting down into it and actually researching it, you find that the wild, wild west was actually a bit more interesting than the pictures we get of it in Hollywood. And there's actually, uh, for example, many of the cowboys were uh, black and Hispanic, right? The first cowboys were actually Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is a much higher uh, black population than we think of. I mean, in 1860, uh, the population of Texas was a third black. And that was because everyone had brought, the, all the whites had brought slaves with them to work the, the herds and farms. And you've also got a lot of Asians uh, coming, not just to work the railroads, but work the gold mines. 
And so much more complicated, much more interesting landscape than you see. It's not just John Wayne. <laughs> I, I have found that too, actually, in my research. One of the things I did in the process of researching is that I went to Barkerville, which I don't know if you've ever heard of, but it's a, you know, a gold rush town in British Columbia in the northern BC, right? So um, I'm from BC, so we have a lot of that, uh, you know, wild west hair. Of course, the Canadian brand of it is a little bit different, but there is a lot of similarities. Once everybody was here for that, right. their gold, and they were going to make their individual fortunes or die trying, and they were very adventurous people. There was uh, an independently wealthy widow who owned this one uh, public house and library. She established the first library in Barkerville. I thought she was just the coolest, and there was a uh, a very enterprising uh, newspaper publisher who hiked a you know 19th century uh, printing press through brambles bushes and narrow mountain passes right <clears throat> and they took us on you know like a wagon ride on one of these passes and it's been fixed up since then and i was like i don't want to fall <laughs> you know <laughs> but you know this this huge thing and then established his own newspaper, you know, and, and there was also a very large Asian population, like you said, and they lived in, they had their own, you know, sort of Chinatown, as it were, in Barkerville, but the oldest, one of the oldest buildings in the country is still there, and it was a, um, for the the tongs at the time one of the one of the tongs right before they were associated with criminal <coughs> organizations although they were running a gambling and um, lottery outfit at that time which i thought was interesting and if you remember the tong you could just go there and they would provide for you and they would take care of you when you were sick and infirm and you know i thought you know people we, we got to pay more attention to this stuff and figure yeah. this out but yeah i agree with you there's so much going there on there and everybody was there with this whole um you know just i'm i'm not happy with the life i've left behind for whatever reason or i think there's a better chance to do something right. different here so you got a lot of characters who were not doing what the regular uh, society of the time we're doing and that's of course where there oh, are so stories, many stories right? so fantastic stuff now why add the the crazy you know the the science fictiony fantasy horror elements into it when there's already so much there i can just hear somebody asking because it's fun right it adds all sorts of neat <laughs> stuff and then you get to throw in vampires and werewolves and all sorts of cool stuff i i, I don't know it's interesting i uh like writing stuff set here in Seattle, partially because Seattle has such a disreputable history. And if you're not aware, like a lot of the gold miners came through Seattle on their way uh, up north and many of them did not depart. This was actually a den of iniquity and there were laws passed because for example, uh, <laughs> You, you couldn't have flower pots above the second floor uh, in windows. And it was because the prostitutes were using them to kill people. And so, oh <laughs> I love it so wow. much, I'm sorry. So basically, you know, like a guy had come up and, and then they'd go down to the street level and they'd take aim with a flower pot and bean them and then just roll them. Wow. I, I, and it's just awful, right? I'm not advocating killing people with flower pots. Um, but it's, you know, it's details like that. But I, I think one of the other things is that it's safe to add that layer, right? It, and that layer has its appeal in and of itself. But when we're writing in the present day, we're living in a world where between cell phones and drones and facial recognition and all of this, fantasy is becoming less and less possible as part of kind of writing about the real world and weird Western is still pretty safe to put stuff in. 
that's a very good point. I can't disagree with that at all. I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it too. I, I think it's so fun. There's so much. It just, I think there's uh, this huge tapestry and with all these different elements to draw on, you can yeah. do just about yeah. anything. I find, I find too, you can even, uh, I get a lot of inspiration from spaghetti yeah. westerns and the old pulp stuff. Right. But yeah. then I flip it. Yeah. Right. Cause I think to myself, you know, how, you know, this doesn't have to be in this particular way. What if you changed it here? Right. And then you added something crazy and then, I don't know. I just, I like doing that. I think that, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, one of the things that I, I think is, uh, is really cool is that, uh, it's, it draws on an older elements mm -hmm. as well. Right. Like when you think about it, the Western, Spaghetti Westerns came about, right, because people wanted to tell samurai stories for Western people, mm -hmm. right? And then samurai uh, movies began to borrow elements from Westerns. And you'll see a lot of uh, parallels in that era between a couple of different, very famous movies. There's also that, uh, it's like an adapted, I mean, okay, high fantasy is basically Arthurian tales, often. right? You have knights in shining armor, right? Often. You're right. Okay, We're often, taking a euro Perhaps I should say sword and sorcery with that. more than high fantasy. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Right. Oh, you're right. Okay. But traditionally, right? And then, but you can... I mean, when it, when you have the, you know, the spaghetti Western version of the, the gunslinger involved, right? The lawman or the sheriff or whatever, right? Now, that's just another knight in shining armor story in yeah. a way, isn't it? Right? And you don't have to stick with the old tropes mm -hmm. with that. Anybody can do that because this is the West and, you know, people people are there to be who they are and seek lives as themselves anyway right so, i mean historically we have lots of uh, powerful women we have lots of people of different races we have lots of queer people that we're now proving were queer right and that's one of the reasons why they yeah. came there different religions different philosophies right so you can you can now take that high fantasy you know arthurian hero centric story anybody can be the hero yeah. it doesn't have to be just one person that's it right? i think and i like that too. and one of the figures that i want to point people at is the guy who was actually the model for the lone ranger uh bass reeves was originally uh a, he was a former slave and uh, was a U.S. Marshal for, I believe, 32 years, something like that. In fact, I'm going to put a link to his uh, biography because yeah, I can do, do that with uh, Magic of Livestarter. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool book. It's called Black Gun, Silver Star, uh, The Story and Legend of Front uh, Bass Reeves. And it's really, I highly recommend it because he's awesome and it will emphasize to people just how different the Wild West was than what you think. I think that's awesome. I cannot wait. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, then. I'm flip back and forth through the whole uh, ta interview talking about both okay. Weird Western and steampunk. What do you like writing about steampunk? What is what is it that appeals to you? Well, it's that particular. It's much the same thing, right? I think all of that stuff is going to apply to steampunk, but it's also got. It's interesting because a lot of steampunk is cited sort of in the British Empire. And the British Empire has all this sort of colonial stuff going on. It's got all this imperialist policies going on. And of course, with Weird Western, you've got a lot of uh, this stuff going on there too with America. And in fact, anybody who's writing Weird Western should go look up the timeline of the American Indian Wars for something that is just truly sobering and disappointing. 
Um, but I think you get a chance to sort of ex explore class stuff, right? That, you know, the, the workers and industrialization and, and sort of that's been, I think when steampunk first came out, right? All the sort of the steampunk heroes were these sort of rich dilettantes trotting around the globe or whatever. But in recent years, you start seeing uh, other figures uh, speaking and suddenly the uh, Zeppelin mechanics are getting a chance to tell their stories too. One of the things I really enjoyed about uh, The Court of Error, which was the first book in uh, Stephen Hunt's series there, was that uh, his protagonist was a right. Dickens-esque street urchin, right? And that was fantastic as far as I was concerned. Yeah. So yeah, it, there's a lot of possibility there too because everyone's so it was not a time of mm -hmm. ideas right mm -hmm. and people were very you know the colonial the colonial stuff is awful and this is one of the reasons why i actually chose to do like a post-apocalyptic variation of weird west and steampunk i took a cue from sm sterling and the laws of physics changed not quite in the same uh -huh. way it's not uh -huh. internal combustion i'm not that much of a thief i filed that's off it, the serial it. numbers but <laughs> well picasso says don't but uh, yeah, go I ahead wanted... sorry yeah, no, no, that's right. The uh, a hack will uh, will steal and a uh, will file off the serial it's, number, something like that. It's was, it's was that the don't question? borrow steal. But, don't borrow steal. Right. I'm oh, sorry. I keep going, writing that's over cool. you. I will. Yeah. Sit back. No, no, that's that's cool. <laughs> But uh, no, that's great. But I uh, I did that because I didn't want to have this oppressive colonialism that I had to deal mm -hmm. with, right? I wanted to have, it, okay, there's racism, but it's between elves and, and bugs, right? And it's not between, you know, nobody cares how much melanin you have in your skin. That's not right. the point, right? And nobody cares if you're gay or not. And nobody cares if you're trans. They don't care, right? Because, you know, it's kind of hard to be prejudiced towards that when you've got, you know, giant mantis grasshopper dudes living in the waste right so you know but uh but I, yeah so i wanted i wanted that freedom from that so but i'm aware of it right and i expect that my characters i haven't written the story yet but i've got a feeling they're going to run into that at some point and it's going to be a bit of a philosophical there's lots more weird west stories coming so right but yeah um okay where was i going with that <laughs> the problem is i get excited and i start talking about this stuff and i'm so i find that a lot of people don't know what weird western is steampunk has more of a uh like people are mostly aware of steampunk now it's gotten a lot even some yeah. mainstream attention i think finally and uh people can visualize steampunk transported to the americas of the time right. they can do that right uh tv tropes calls that uh cattle punk so i've used that description too yeah. and i like that right but but nobody knows weird west yeah. right unless you're a graphic novel reader for some reason graphic novels it's it's a huge thing there's like massive stuff out and I, I will tell you you know about that the thing that i use with comic book readers is i say do you remember jonah hex because the jonah hex comics were tremendously yeah. weird western i haven't read okay i think i read like two jonah oh, hex fine. comics but i did see the movie too recently i'm sure the movie wasn't anywhere near as good <laughs> yeah Right. So I find as a result, we were talking about this a bit over Twitter, right, that it's a hard sell. It's difficult to convince people that it might be something they want to explore. Do you find that? And if so, how do you deal with it? Well, you can do a couple things. And one is that you could disguise it as steampunk and be like, it's steampunk set in the West, right? <laughs> because it is sort of uh, uh, permeable. Um, I, 
point I'm trying to think like how would I sell it to somebody who's a I guess a part of it it sort of depends on what sort of reader they are because like with my mother I would I would be like it's westerns and you like westerns but it's got some fantasy aspects whereas if it were somebody who loved fantasy you know I would I would you know it's like fantasy but it's set in the west uh, you know it, it that that sort of thing um Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think how you entice someone and it really sort of depends on what kind of reader they are. But boy, if you've got somebody who loves Westerns, I think they're going to like it, right? Like my uh, father-in-law loves uh, that sort of thing. And uh, like he loves Westerns, he loves Horatio Hornblower. So I've, I've found fantasy versions of, of Louis L'Amour. I found fantasy versions of Horatio Hornblower. You know, it's just easier that way. Fair enough. Yeah, it's I I've uh, I find I have trouble explaining to people exactly what it is. They you, know, you start telling them, okay, so it's like a western, right? And fantasy readers are like, okay, yeah. I'm out, you know. Yeah. And then he, with the with the the western readers, and you're like, except there's you know sorcerers, and they're like, okay, I'm out, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I keep running into that, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I just haven't found my audience yet. Maybe it just hasn't gotten enough attention as yeah. a genre or a subgenre. Maybe, maybe, maybe you will be the person who establishes it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I can dream, right? <laughs> okay, so... Tell me, tell us a bit. You should get an opportunity to promote your stuff too. Tell us about your weird Western stuff and your okay. steampunk stuff. Where to find it and what to look so for. So there's two places people can find it. Well, actually, there's three places. Among the many places people can find it. Uh, one place is I do have some scattered throughout my story collections, the fantasy ones. And so uh, there's one called Neither Here Nor There which has uh, at least a couple steampunk stories in it. Uh, there's also a collection that is specifically steampunk called Altered America, uh, which we mentioned Wild Wild West uh, a while back, and it has my attempt to refer to the Wild Wild West episode that scared the shit out of me when I was a little kid. Uh, so I've re I have a re steampunk version of oh, that. Really? Um, and... My Patreon, uh, one of the things that I often do, uh, my Patreon supporters get a story a month and often that is a steampunk story. And I need to do another collection sometime. It's just that things are busy. I hear you. Yeah, you, uh, you're a very busy person. I'm, I'm a busy person, but you're, I admire mm -hmm. you. You must have like amazing time management skills. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I, you know, I admire it. <laughs> Perpetual chaos. Uh, okay. Perpetual chaos. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> okay, so what are some of the, the things that you, when you're reading Weird West or Steampunk, what are some of the things that you really resonate with when you see it in in a, you know, in a story and as a, a theme that's explored, something that you think is... I don't know. This is probably a really challenging question off the top of your well, head. And I, I was thinking, I, I think it, it is the weird Western that finds those edges. And I'm thinking of two particular favorite weird Western series. One is by uh, Gemma Files called the Hex Slinger series, where the hero is a, basically a gay cowboy magician uh, named Chance. Parmetier, I may be uh, saying that incorrectly, and and it's it's uh, it's wonderful. It, it, it's a wonderful uh, trilogy, and then there is another series by Lila uh, Bowen, who is, was the pen name for Delilah Dawson, uh, if you're familiar with uh, her Star Wars novel. Uh, but I think the first book is called An Unkindness of Ravens, and that is actually a character who's trans, but also uh, half native, uh, half black and in Texas and kind of, you know, facing all sorts of difficulties 
beyond all the kind of magic crap that's going on. And, and those are really, both of those books are, or both of those series are a lot of fun. And I think both have three in them now. Um, so I, you know, I don't, if it's that sort of John Wayne, you know, I'm the, the hard bitten macho cowboy out hunting down the murder in Indian or something like that. I'm just like, well, screw that. I don't want to read that. I, I want to read something interesting. I want to read something that challenges the traditional Western. That's cool. I agree with you there too. I think it's one of the things that, because, you know, like I really enjoy kid right i i i like all that stuff i read mm -hmm. historical fiction historical adventure fiction i read a lot of it um we've already discussed that in different settings i'm a fan of horatio hornblower i love patrick yeah. o'brien right i thought louis lamore was pretty awesome too but you're right it's all geared towards a particular type of person and the things that we're allowed to do in fantasy is go hey this isn't our world we can yeah. do it we can have whatever kind of heroes or villains or anti-heroes yeah. that we want. I have the first two books of the Hex Slinger series. I haven't re read them yet. They're on my yeah. TBR list. I didn't know there was a third yet. I have to go find it now. <laughs> Maybe uh, in the video description when I post the YouTube version of this, I'll that would, put that links would be to good. some of this stuff so that people can. Well, can I, I, I want to pitch uh, another couple yeah. books that I think people might overlook that I think would be useful. Uh, people that are trying sure. to write weird westerns, and I, I will at some point mention again that I teach a class on writing weird western. Um, yes, yeah, so you should. I will definitely, definitely do that. that too. <laughs> but Louis Lamore's autobiographical. Uh, he has two books uh, about uh, his life, and those are full of so much good detail, and they're really interesting. And they're also, I will warn you, if if you're the sort of person who jots, who adds book list with your your reading books it will add uh, at least 30 or 40 <laughs> books to your list and and it, it's a it's just it's a i recommend oh. both of them tre tremendously they're really good and really interesting uh, my father-in-law uh, turned me on to them and i'm just delighted that he did because they will really make you feel i think the soul of the western and i think if there is anybody that we can think of as writing the soul of the Western. It, it's Louis L'Amour, maybe with Zane Gray uh, following on his heels, but Louis L'Amour. And I, you know, if you wanted to do, if you wanted a good template for a weird Western, as we said, steal, don't borrow, take a Louis L'Amour and take the plot and say, you know, like what happens when I add dragons or, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that's a totally <laughs> valid starting point. I love doing that, actually. This is something I, I found. I was, uh, okay, so I'm reading this list of uh, classic science fictions, the uh, SF Masterworks imprint, right? And I've decided to read the whole thing, one a month until I'm done. And right now it's going to take me yeah. about nine years yeah. and I've done two, but, <laughs> but I'm going to. And then I'm going to do the SF Mistress yeah. Works. Hopefully yeah. that's the plan. But but uh, I'm I'm reading all these, you know, influential novels that I had no idea where some of the stuff comes from because, of course, you know, I just missed it. I'm too young, right? And I remember, it, okay, so Stephen King wrote The mm -hmm, Stand, mm -hmm. right? And my partner, Jamie, who is uh, 18 years my elder, right, he said to me that um, you know, he had no real respect for it because it was basically like Earth Abides, right? So I went and found Earth Abides. It was uh, on my mm -hmm. list and I read it and I recognized where Stephen King, I'm certain, I will ask him if I ever meet him, I will ask him if this is where he got the idea because I saw it clear as day, right? There was a scene where the, the main character is uh, traipsing around the devastated plague uh um, emptied America and he reaches the New York tunnel and he looks down into it. This is yes, Earth Abides I'm talking yes. about. And he, he thinks, 
oh, there's, you know, I don't want to go in there. There's probably some really horrible stuff in there. I, I just can't bring myself to do it. And he leaves. And I bet Stephen King read that and went, what would have happened if he'd gone in? And I bet that was one of the key scenes around which he wrote the book, because of course, then there's that scene with Larry Underwood leaving New York yeah. through the tunnel. Yeah. Right. And, you know, which is scared the crap out of me when I was 11 and read it. Oh, that's, so. <laughs> that's a terrifying, terrifying scene. And that's, that's one of my favorite books. I go back and reread that every few years because the stand I think is just a tremendous book. I love it. I I invested in the uh, yep. hardcover, you know, re you know expanded edition that he intended to publish in the first place, and have never yeah. regretted the expenditure. Yeah. So, but okay, so I kind of did that actually. I had that moment, right? I was reading the Dark Tower. This is one of the influences that led me to these stories, and I said to myself, "What was Gilead or Gilead like?" Before everything went mm -hmm. to hell, who were the gunslingers? What did they stand for? Both the problems and, you know, heroes they were supposed to be. One of the influences, right, that led me down this mm -hmm. road, right? Although, you know, again, it's not a perfect world, but that was, that was where I had that. Okay, right, so steal, not borrow, right? So, um. Yeah. Um, right. We were talking about things for uh, people who are writing weird westerns and steampunk. Yes. Do you have any other suggestions? Um, I have a number of suggestions. And so like one is go to museums and get a sense of the physical objects, objects used at the time. Uh, go and, and look and, and see uh, what people used as far as as eating, and you will find, particularly in in museums that, that uh, specialize in this stuff, you'll find all sorts of interesting details. Like I had, didn't know that the uh, cowboys actually often ate popcorn on the trail uh, because it was easily transportable and it was a good snack. And a bag of popcorn at your rehip was actually a decent trail food. Um, Along the same lines, you can find one of the things that happens historically at this time is there's a lot of pioneers going west and a lot of young women are leaving their families and they don't have their mothers and families to teach them how to do stuff. And so you get this rise of the housekeeping manuals. You get, uh, I can't remember, like Mrs. Beaton's oh. book of household cookery and stuff. And I, I actually, I love these. I have uh, in the kitchen, I think four or five of them. Uh, and they're just basically the manuals of this is how you clean the house and this is how you cook the food. And when you look at the recipes and look at the ways people clean the house, it is just absolutely fascinating. And that sort of stuff is, I think, it's golden uh, when you are writing stories because it lets you bring in sensory stuff and sensory stuff is, is you know, these little details are going to convince somebody that they're there. Um, so yeah, be, be aware of the popcorn. One thing I learned, I, I agree with you completely. One of the things I learned was that, uh, pretty much all the modern conveniences that we know of, except for anything to do with computers or the internet were there when we're talking about late period mm -hmm. Victorian stuff, mm -hmm. it's just all hand crank operated or horse operated right. instead of right like there's hand crank washing machines and they're a lot less difficult than a washboard i can tell you you know and then there's uh the the um the graders that built roads the the things that are dragged yeah. behind our modern graders are exactly the same exactly I mean, it's the just same. that it was a horse pulling yeah. it at one time yeah yeah i'd also suggest people go spend some time with horses and let Thing in your weird west setting maybe they all ride dinosaurs who knows but if they ride horses go spend some time with them because otherwise you know yeah. judith tar has done some amazing yeah. riding on this and horses are not motorcycles right. you right. don't just put fuel in them and they go 
Yeah, if you've got a uh, disposable income, uh, there are various camps aimed at writers that will teach you how to groom and ride and, and sort of give you all the horsey details. If you do not have that kind of disposable income, Judy Tarr's uh, Twitter and Patreon, I mean, she is very good at providing, I think, really good details. And she's nice and we should support her because she writes awesome fiction. Yes, this is absolutely true all around. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that too. <laughs> um, another thing, I'm uh, I'm planning on doing this, so maybe this is an option for people around. Um, uh, there is a local uh, therapeutic horse riding association. They're always looking for volunteers to help muck out stalls oh, yeah. and things. I'm planning on doing that because yeah. why not? You know, then you learn about all the background stuff and you get the feel and you know what it smells like and. You know, which is important if you're going to bring people into your world, right? You got to give them the colorful details. I bet this sounds bizarre to you, right? Because I don't know. It seems like everybody knows about guns in the United States, even if you don't want, right? But no, oh, I, you have something I, I, to say I on that. Okay, cool. I'll let I you actually know. last year uh, took a class on shooting like if you go down to your local gun range uh, they, they often will have uh, just a sort of basic gun safety class and they'll let you go shoot a gun which i had never done uh, we have my husband has uh, a couple guns and i was always kind of like ah, guns uh, but they teach you how to load it and they explain how it works and you know it's not not just i do i do think it's good to shoot a gun just in terms of a kind of this is what it feels like because i mean like i know i was just like the recoil is going to knock you back flying across the room 20 feet if you're not careful that sort of thing and and our folks actually did have like a revolver and, and that sort of stuff to shoot but just the mechanics of how a gun and ammunition works will knowing sort of the basics will keep you from making any stupid mistakes Yep. When I started out, I knew nothing and I had to read a lot to try to sound convincing. But then my friend Graham Barber, he was also an independent writer, took me up to the range. He's done a couple of tours in Afghanistan. He has a couple of different pieces of hardware, a lot more than the average Canadian, I think, <laughs> including a couple of 45s and, you know, a, a few other things and some old yeah, uh, old style yeah. rifles and you know and he's like okay and this is how you do this works and this is how you you know brace it mm -hmm. to your shoulders so it doesn't knock you on your ass and you know and you know what i learned is things like shotguns are really yes. loud they're scary loud yes i was not prepared <laughs> you know bracing the shotgun and i fired it off and you know i've got my ear protection on and everything and it went kablow and i'm like did something blow up yeah. you know yeah <laughs> it's 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 i really i i i, I do recommend that, that writers when they can go and get you know if you're gonna write about being on a boat go be on a boat if you can and i know it's not always possible but you know at least go Imagine you're standing on a boat or something. I, it's, it's, yeah, it, it, that sort of stuff is really useful. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we, I was going to recommendations, but for, you know, weird Western and steampunk stories that you've really enjoyed, we kind of covered that already. Do you have anything to add to that? I think I should... You know, I, don't know. I will mention like a couple shout outs to people. One is uh, DJ Butler has a uh, kind of an early American uh, series that starts with, I believe, Witchy Eye. And he's also got a lovely uh, steampunk book. It's basically Mormons and steampunk called The City of the Saints. Um, That's excellent. What a good oh, idea. So Mormons good. were such an important force in the oh, West. It, so that's it's awesome. fabulous. It's got like Mark Twain is in it and uh Richard Burton and Edgar Allan Poe is a spy and it's awesome. 
Uh, Ann and Jeff Vandermeer have done all sorts of uh, great steampunk anthologies uh, that are just fabulous, including, a, you know, coffee table books, but also collecting some great steampunk. And I will point to, I strangely enough am in both of these, uh, the Mammoth Book of Steampunk oops, and the Mammoth Book of nice. Steampunk Adventures are good um, there is a wonderful steampunk uh, anthology called The Sea is Ours, which is uh, tales of Asian, uh, Southeast Asian uh, steampunk. Um, steampunk is a kind of Afro-American uh, uh, steampunk that I have, I just added to my pile and I haven't read it yet. And there's someone else along those lines I wanted to mention. Who is it? Oh, my God. Oh, Joselle Vanderhoof has two anthologies called Steam Powered, which are lesbian steampunk. So lots of, oh, and Nisi Shaw's uh, Everfair. Ah, right. Well, that's cool. Now, okay, yeah. So now I my TBR yeah, probably yeah, just got yeah. much that's, bigger. That's, but that's okay. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, I have run out of questions that I have thought to ask, and we're not quite at an hour. Do you have anything that you want to talk about? Or? Um, I. Yeah, actually, I'll mention a, a couple of things and I, I will talk. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about kind of like what we do in the steampunk and weird Western class, uh, which is aimed at. Yes, it's aimed at uh, people that are writing steampunk or weird Western or you know, like I am weird Western curious or that sort of thing. And so we start out by kind of uh, defining what they are and sort of what the characteristics uh, of each are. Uh, we talk about. I have my outline here that I'm scheduling. Oh, and we talk about so like all the advantages, like all this stuff, kind of like here's all the cool history. Uh, I try to provide a timeline that kind of gives you like here's the most important events that you probably are going to want to incorporate. And I do think like you know like the American Indian Wars, you should go look at if you're writing in the West because there's a shit ton of them, and they may well affect what you're writing. Um, we also talk, uh, we spend time, I talk about steampunk and problematic history, and I talk about the Weird West and its own set of problems, uh, because this is something that I think people need to, to grapple with. Uh, one of my earliest steampunk stories is uh, called Clockwork Fairies, and it was an attempt to address the fact that there were no people of color in steampunk uh, at that time that I, you know, that I could find. And since then, uh, other better people have addressed it, it, but you know, you need to look at these things. Um, we talk about economics because I think it's really important to think about the economics of the time. I, well, anytime you're writing fiction, you should think about the economics and what's scarce and what's in demand. Um, but often because uh, technology is the, the degree to which technology can affect society is usually affected by its cost. So if it's cheap technology, it's gonna be widespread. If it's expensive technology, it's, it's gonna be there for the rich. Um, and we spend some time thinking about, and I think this is important talking about what puts the punk in steampunk and what puts the weird in weird Western. And I, we haven't really talked about kind of, and then actually we're focusing on weird Western, so this is tangential, but people writing steampunk should be aware, you know, that there is that punk part. It's not just sort of a texture. It is actually a sort of a way to challenge the system uh, in the way that, that, that punk did, right? You create the power structure. You, you challenge the power structures by creating art and tearing down the structures. Uh, and weird Western, I think, needs to be weird. Uh, it needs to have some, some truly odd, fabulous, interesting stuff. Uh, to really work well. Uh, and then after that, I spent some time talking about kind of like how to write dialogue with the right flavor, which, you know, one of the things you want to do is you want to go read a bunch of stuff that's set in that time period and probably stuff that's written in that time period. But you don't want to be writing uh, Victorian, you know, like a replica of Victorian 
prose because it's horrible. Anyway, it's not horrible, but it's it's, it's very long and it's it's not a, a style that we're used to. So you have to sort of create a replica of Victorian prose that is easier for today's readers. And we talk a little bit about texture and how to get historical texture. And we talk about some steam basics, because I think if you're going to work with steampunk, don't be like the poor friend of mine who was writing a wonderful steampunk book that depended on steam powered submarines. And if you understand how steam power works, you know that they're really, could, it would be really hard to have a steam powered marine, uh, submarine that is powered by combustion because you're underwater and that's consuming all the oxygen in the air for one thing. Yeah. And then we have a wrap up. A very good point. No, that's cool, actually. Thank you very much for that, because that gives me a couple of places to go with the conversation. One is the uh, problematic elements of the time period. That's something that's interesting. I, I'm uh, I'm also putting together it's called uh, Gunsmoke and Dragonfire, oh, cool. which is a fantasy Western anthology. And I've had a few submissions now, and I've accepted a few stories. One of the stories that I accepted, I hesitated over because it had some very challenging racist language in it. I think he successfully mitigated it by the way things progressed in the plot and how he pointed that this was the character and their point of view and not the overall like right. this is not a statement of how people are it was what the character thought about how they are right right so but yeah it's something that comes up because yeah it was a thing in in barkerville right there was a lot of animosity between the chinatown oh, yeah. section oh, yeah. and the and they, you know, they hardly mingled, right? The only place they really mingled much was in the lottery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And, and that was, you know, you, you got to address that. You have to, you have to figure out a way to do that without making it so oppressive that, you know, it's like Tarzan yeah. and nobody wants yeah. to read it, yeah. right? Yeah, so... One of the reasons why I avoided actual historical period, <laughs> right? Because I was like, oh, you know, I don't know. Some of that was really, really heavy. But it depends, right? It depends on how you approach it. You can have, you know, in an alternate history, maybe things are different. Well, right? it's interesting. I, I was talking about this uh, with a, a friend who's working on a book. And this is how I had just, I had been doing a lot of research for the class and I mentioned the thing about, hey, in Texas, a third of the population was black. And he was like, wow, I, because he has, he is, he's of color and, and his protagonist is, and he's like, wow, that really changes things for me because he's not alone. Uh, and, and so I, I think one of the places where you, you challenge sort of the traditional structures is by actually being accurate and saying, actually, yeah, there were Blacks, there were Asians, there were Hispanics, but at the same time, certainly not uh, whitewashing, if you will excuse the pun, uh, you know, the history and the fact that like, for example, in California had all those poor folks uh, the, who had been Mexican and then uh, the land ends up becoming California and they're promised citizenship and so they decide to stick around and strangely enough their newborn citizenship does not prevent their land from being taken and in fact you get all these American laws uh, getting passed including uh, to use a really ugly term what they called the greaser laws which was stuff like if you had uh, a Mexican person who was uh, unemployed they could be arrested for vagrancy. Uh, just as, you know, and we mentioned the Asian uh, folks, we get the, what is it, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is, hey, we, we won't allow Chinese to immigrate uh, for 10 years. And the other interesting thing about the, the Asian stuff is that those uh, Chinatowns, which were very insular, right, which were, because that was the, how they survived, right, were these very close-knit uh, little communities, they were 95% male. Uh, that they, they're really the women weren't coming yes, over that is very and there are also a lot of stories about uh, women in disguise uh, a lot of 
lot of women who come over and pretend to be men, Chinese uh, women who become, who try to be, and then there's a lot of actually women passing as men in the Wild West. There's, a, I, I think, um, many more than one would suspect. I think we're learning more about that mm -hmm. now and we're starting to realize that anywhere that you exclude somebody, they're going to find a way mm -hmm. to be included, mm -hmm. right? So as men and going to war and everything else since there has, since been, has been an exclusion, yeah. right? So, yeah, and likewise, right? You know, any, anywhere, yeah, we don't like being prevented from going places, so we'll find ways, right? Humans, we're just like that. But that's, that's it. That's a cool thing. Yeah, and that that is. Uh, well, I think it's. But <laughs> we always want to challenge and go. Hey, yeah. wait a minute! You can't. Yeah. Out here, yeah. hold on. Right. Um, yeah, that is an important aspect about the Asian communities, and it was something that uh, a lot of tension. Just you know, as it does in other environments mm -hmm. that are gender exclusionary. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's for that, you know, some of which being that, you know, these guys were, you know, they were, they're camp workers, right? They're, they're trying to send money back mm -hmm. home to the family, right? At, at a long distance. And in some cases, it's because they found it difficult to get established. So if they weren't established, mm -hmm. it was appropriate for them to drag some poor girl into this nonsense. So they, you know, struggled to make their fortune and pan their gold and, just like everybody yeah. else there, right? So it was it's just it's so interesting. I learned so much when I was there. It's just fascinating. Oh, yeah. I would really like to see Asian-centered, uh, you know, Weird West cattle punk thing sometime. I'm not the person to write it. I'm, but I'm thinking, okay, so this isn't, oh, God, what is the name of that book? Sorry, as I swear silently. Oh, there is a book that is exactly what you're describing. And I can sort of like remember pieces of it. And I can't remember the title, but I, I, if I think of it, I will let you know what it is. I don't know. No, no problem. I can include it in the yeah. update when I post the video and I can put it in the video description. So look for it there, guys, if, when you're, whether you're watching this on YouTube or on Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah, and there was something else in there that I was really fascinated by. Your, the yeah, get the, the the texture, the feel. There, oh yes, there has to be weird in weird western. Has to be weird. There has to be yeah. punk in steam. Yeah, yeah, both things are important. Yeah, um, you were gonna. Well, that's to I. I think we do this thing where you know, like it's kind of catchy to be like uh, add punk to the the word, and right? So it starts with cyberpunk, and then you get steampunk, and then you you know like diesel punk and tool punk and monk punk, and you know, like if people are being very clever, and I think that's that's nice, but I think you really have to remember that punk is about challenging, and punk is not pretty. Uh, punk is, you know, it's, it's loud and it's fast moving and it's aggressive and it's in your face and it takes ugly shit and makes it beautiful and it's anti mainstream and you don't have to, you know, like you don't have to create, I mean, because we're writers, right? We're writing to sell and you don't want to, you know, create an actual like totally punk text because God knows what it'd be like, like this free thing that people could take. Um, but you don't want to forget that because as soon as you forget that and you produce something that's just sort of a mainstream story with an artificial layer of color, you know, either the steampunk texture or the weird Western texture laid over it, that's just boring and inauthentic, in my opinion. I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> that punk element is important. I think if you're not, uh, if you're not challenging something, which is, I guess why it's so fun to take characters that are not typically the heroes yeah. in the old uh, genre tropes and, you know, put them in the position of being the protagonist yeah. and watching their story. I mean, that's what part of the point yeah. of that, right? You're challenging, you're going, Hey, you know, this, uh, this could include other people too. Yeah, I love that. And the weird element. 
in what sense do you think? Because you're you're going for the broader sense. You're not just talking about you know something like okay, add right. a dragon. You're talking about add a dragon with a purpose. Yes, right? and, and so uh, I'm thinking also kind of like you know the movement that we call the new weird where you get a lot of emphasis on stuff that is, uh, you know, like it's really sort of horrifying. There's a lot of sort of like body stuff and a lot of just sort of like surreal stuff. And I think, you know, it does have to be something that, that, that genuinely is odd and unexpected and just crazy weird. Because again, there's energy to that. And if you're doing something that is expected, why read it? You know, if it's weird, you really do have to, you know, turn the dial up to 11 on weirdness. Can't be half-hearted. What is it? It's like being a little bit pregnant. You can't be just a little bit weird. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. They, hey, that's cool. Actually, I, I feel since this is my first uh, venture into the mm -hmm. genre, I mean, you know, okay, it's six stories that have made one big right. book that's like over 100,000 right. words, right? But because this is my first venture into it, I'm not certain of a lot of things. You know how when you start something mm -hmm. new, you're like, okay, well, what about this, right? And you're trying to explain stuff to people and you're like, and it has giant bug gladiators, right? And you're afraid to tell people that because you don't want to drive yeah. them off. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I guess it does have to be that extreme. If you don't have stuff like that, then you're not doing it justice, no, are no. you? So I'm a little less uncertain well, about my giant bug glasses. And, and I'm going to say one of the masters of this art form who we didn't mention is Joe R. Lansdale, who is just an amazing writer and people should, should read anyway. Um, but I love his book, The Drive-In Theater, which is not weird Western and is not steampunk or anything but it's just goddamn weird and i love that book because it tells you as a writer you can do whatever you like and you're like suddenly like yeah the world's a huge stage set and it's just like everything falls apart and here's this guy shooting popcorn out of his head and it's just it's just so <laughs> fabulous you know and, and i think you know that's the thing about writing weird stuff if you if you're gonna write weird stuff go full out because that is the joy of weird stuff is is uh, we just watched um gravity falls or i just watched gravity falls because my husband went out of town and i finished it without him and he's still reproaching me for that uh but gravity falls gets just like super goddamn weird at the end and it's just like each episode just gets weirder and weirder and it's just like stuff is getting squared to the point which is really fascinating, it actually starts to creep out from the program and corrupts the intro sequence, uh, you know, and, and so like the stuff that's happening in the storyline uh, changes the way that this intro that you're used to seeing from the first season. It's, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, be, be weird. Be that's super cool. weird. Yeah, kind of. I don't know, outer the the reboot of Outer Limits was kind of the weird thing that I oh, watched yeah. as a kid, right? You know, we control the we control the signal, we control the horizontal and the vertical. And then there's this big eye, you know, it's like <laughs> That's it exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why not? What have you got coming up in the near future that people should know? About? Um, I well, I just had a novel that came out, uh, Hearts of Tibet, and oh. I have a book. I, okay, I, I read, the, read first the first one. one. I'm, I'm going to throw in for you here. I read, uh, Be I read Beasts of Tibet, which is that's the one right. That came, well, it it, it Hearts is. of Tibet. And I just started Hearts, and and, and people can start yeah, either and, way. Uh, uh, I love it. It's uh, it should it should have like a severed unicorn horn lying on a cobblestone or a severed unicorn head lying on a cobblestone street. This is what I think should be. Be warned. It's not as innocent as it looks. Not by a long shot. It, it, it <laughs> might. Steampunk. It might be a trifle dark here and there. Yes. Ha! <laughs> but this is less dark. I'll point. I'll point Sweet. out to this uh, too. I have a book called "Moving from Idea to Finished Draft," uh, which is nonfiction and which is based on another one of my classes. And uh, it's based on the idea of, people kept coming and saying, how do I separate the good ideas from the bad ideas? And what they meant was, you know, like they knew like they'd start with one idea and sometimes it would produce a whole story and sometimes it would just peter out. And 
what I realized is that it's not a question of how to separate the good ideas from the bad ideas. Usually, uh, there are no there are no ideas you cannot do anything with. You know, and of course now I can think of like twenty exceptions. Um, but usually, it's a question of kind of like what does that particular form give you? Because if you've got like an entire scene, it's going to give you some stuff. Whereas if you've just got the title, it's going to give you totally different things. Uh, if you've got just a character where you're like, oh, I always wanted to write a character about this, you know, raccoon motorcycle mechanic. Again, you know, like different stuff. And so it's a question of sort of like looking at what the form of the idea gives you and then the way that you move on from that uh, differs. So I, I covered, I think, 24 different ways that ideas could appear to you. And of course, I discovered a 25th as soon as the book was out. That's awesome. Of course, of course, it's always it's always how yeah, it works, yeah. isn't it? You're like, oh yeah, and I forgot, yeah. So that's my general advice to people who are starting out. It's never going to be perfect. We got to let it go. Sometime. Never, <laughs> never going to be perfect. <laughs> well, this was really awesome. cool, and I have had a lot of fun, and I was looking forward to this for a long time. So thank you very much for coming to talk with me today i really appreciate it well this has been uh check out oh sorry i'm, I'm sorry yeah. i'm still mastering the art yeah. no, no. <laughs> we're ready to change other cat stuff on her website we're gonna have some links right um she is awesome she's an amazing writer and she's just an all-around cool person so you should definitely check out her, her work and please also support once upon a time in the weird west because, you know, I'm excited and I know we can do this. It's going to be fun. You're going to love it. I guarantee you, if you enjoyed this conversation, if this sounds like your stuff, this is what you're going to get. So check I it will out. add my voice. I heartily endorse this message and you should support this Kickstarter. <laughs> All right. Thanks. With that, I'm going to sign off here. All right. Take care. Yep. You bet. Bye bye. Thank you for coming you. and we'll those of you who are checking out the interviews there are some coming up we're going to have a science fantasy panel and we're going to have uh, a few other great um, writers and professionals we're going to have cheer St stevenson papworth who is one of the directors of the band of dystopian authors and fans which is an amazing group that reads a lot of dystopian fiction that i have had some real love from they're great i can't wait to talk to her in person i've only ever talked to her over you know facebook chat so it's gonna be cool and uh we've got cl cannon who is the uh, publisher, the owner publisher for Fiction Atlas Press, which is a small press that started from Indie Roots, and she is going to talk all about that, and I'm really excited, but those aren't going to be for a few days. We're taking the weekend off, so uh, the it's going to be, the next one's going to be on the third, that's Cheer, I believe, and then on the fourth is Courtney and on the fifth is or CL Courtney, right? And then on the fifth is the science fantasy panel. So thank you for coming and I hope to see you at the next one. Support once upon a time in the weird west. <laughs>